And what we know from a cancer perspective is that so many of our cancers are associated with obesity. And really, our most common cancers that we see are associated with obesity. So breast cancer, endometrial, colorectal, prostate, et cetera. Um, but is it really about obesity? Because we have thin cancer patients that have those same diseases. And so my bias is it's not just about obesity, but obesity is actually a common manifestation of our underlying metabolic health. So when we have poor health, we tend to become obese. Um, I think that probably some people have seen uh, some information on um, being obese yet still being healthy. And typically, subcutaneous fat is a, uh, a place where our body can store fat to use later. And when it does that, um, it is kind of preserving our health. But at some point, that system breaks down and then the metabolism starts to go. So what is metabolic health? Well, it's the state of operational function of every cell in your body. Proper cellular function produces proper endocrine function and proper signaling, which produces homeostasis and metabolic health. So when these things are out of whack, we start to lose our optimum health. Mitochondria, which I want us to think about a little bit, these are the cells powerhouses. These are the guys that produce ATP. We want them working optimally. And nutrition, exercise, energy balance, sleep, sunlight, stress, even our thoughts affect our body and affect our mitochondrial health at a cellular level. So these are cells. And these little pink guys um, are our mitochondria. And those are what we're gonna talk a little bit about today. So this is a more complicated view. And you can see, and this is not even as complicated as we could get it. But the bottom line is that within the cell, we have this green mitochondria. And a lot of the uh, pathways, um, the, how we oxidize uh, cellular fluids or, or food to create ATP is happening uh, in this mitochondria. And when our mitochondria become damaged, um, we tend to have more problems. So again, a little more simplistic view, but our mitochondria taking in different substrates. So when we take in uh, glucose and we run it through certain things, we create ATP. But when we run uh, uh, fuel through our electron transport chain, which is kind of our major powerhouse, we actually get much more ATP or energy um, and interestingly, we produce water. I joke that when you're in good metabolic health, you're a little bit like a camel and you produce your own water. So you don't actually have to drink as many cups of water, but when you're burning in a different cycle, you tend not to uh, produce that. So when our mitochondria are healthy, they're operating great and we can operate under a glucose burning situation like in uh, anaerobic exercise, but we can also be uh, working in an aerobic situation, again, where we're um, utilizing oxygen and producing a lot of uh, healthy water uh, in our system. But but mitochondria become damaged. You can see the, this is a healthy mitochondria with these little lines or cristae in them. And this is a damaged mitochondria. This is actually a mitochondria from a glioblastoma multiforme patient. And what happens is that because of stressors throughout our day-to-day -day activities, whether that's food, poor sleep, stress, toxins, um, viruses, uh, those things can actually damage mitochondria. And when mitochondria get damaged, um, they start uh, giving different signals. So they're under stress. And then they tell the nucleus where the DNA lives to change the genes that are on and the genes that are off. So we're not changing the genes, but we're turning oncogenes or cancer genes on and turning tumor suppressor genes off, um, which can then lead to cancer. So if we go back to people who have genetic cancers, BRCA1 or 2, um, or those types of genes that we have found to be pathogenic uh, or linked to cancers, we know that not 100% of those patients actually get cancers. And so why not? because their epigenetics, their tumor suppressor genes and oncogenes are turned on or off differently than those patients who actually get the disease. 
So again, it's not about genetics. So genetics, yes, they load the gun, but diet and lifestyle and other exposures actually pull the trigger. So even though um, cancer can be a genetic disease, it's really a more chronic disease, just like our diabetes. Um, it, it's, it's thought to be related to this underlying metabolic uh, health. So how do we know that? What has been done to, to look at that? Well, th there have been something called nuclear transfer studies. So if we take a normal cell here in green and a tumor cell here in red, and we let them uh, divide and grow, you can see the normal cells produce normal cells and the tumor cells produce tumor cells. But when we take a normal, a normal cell and we put that damaged nucleus into the normal cell, interestingly, they go on to become normal cells. So even though they have a damaged nucleus, so damaged DNA, they're still producing normal cells. But when we take that damaged cell, that cancer cell, and put a good nucleus into it, but guess what, damaged mitochondria, those cells go on and become cancer cells and maybe go on and die. So it's really about what is the health of the mitochondria, not necessarily the health of the nucleus. There have also been kind of the reverse things, mitochondrial transfer studies. So I'm sorry I don't have a pretty picture on this one, but Dr. Elliott actually took cancer cells and he implanted healthy mitochondria into them. Um, and, he, and he looked at a few things. One is that he actually showed the higher grade of the breast cancer cells. So we typically grade breast cancers, grade one, two, and three. And the grade three breast cancer cells had far fewer and more vacuolated mitochondria. So they looked more like that GBM mitochondria. And when they put the normal mitochondria into the breast cancer cells, these cells slowed down their rate of growth. And the better their mitochondria were at the get-go, the slower they grew. So low grades tended to do better with the addition of those normal mitochondria than the high grades. Uh, Dr. Warburg uh, won a Nobel Prize back in 1931. Uh, it was not actually about cancer, but he was a, uh, a cell biologist who did study cancer. And what he found is that even though there were a lot of secondary causes, we think about smoking, et cetera, exposures, um, he found that really the basis of all cancers were the cancer cells themselves burned fuel differently. They started burning sugar, as in anaerobic respiration, even in the presence of oxygen. So these cells were starting to revert back to a primitive type of uh, metabolism. So how do we know that cancer cells do things differently if they burn sugar? Um, well, we have PET scans. So this is an example of a lung cancer scan, a patient with lung cancer who got a PET scan. And if most people are aware that PET scans are a radioactive glucose uh, that is injected and highly metabolic cells take up more glucose, right? Those cells that are depending on more sugar to run pull in more glucose. And then we light, they light up on our special scan. So you can see a nice big yellow area here in the patient's lung, a little lymph node next to it. Kind of this reddish stuff is probably just some normal collapsed lung behind the tumor. And you can see that the brain has some uptake and that's normal because our brain does use a lot of sugar um, for fuel. And you can see that if we look at just a CT scan or a CAT scan, how everything kind of looks gray. So you can't actually tell what area is metabolically different from the adjacent area until we do that PET scan. So this is a, an example of a cell that has an insulin receptor. And an insulin receptor, when we eat glucose or get a spike in glucose, maybe from stress or not sleeping well, but uh, from cortisol, um, we can get a rise in glucose and then our body very smartly figures out how are we going to put this glucose into cells. We don't want a high level of glucose in our bloodstream. So insulin is released from the pancreas and then binds to insulin receptors. When the insulin receptor binds to the wall, 
uh, glucose transporters then move to the surface of the cells and allow the glucose to be pulled into the cells. So the more glucose, typically the more insulin. And when that insulin receptor is working properly, the glucose is um, pulled into the cells. And interestingly enough, there have been numerous studies on cancers looking at insulin receptors, as well as a sister receptor called insulin-like growth factor one. And what they've done is instead of staining breast cancer cells for things like uh, estrogen receptors and progesterone receptors, they stain them for insulin receptors, or they have. And they've done this in various different types of cancers, looking at both insulin and insulin-like growth factors. And what we find in this particular paper, this was done in 1990, um, uh, Dr. Papa showed that breast cancer cells had significantly more insulin receptors, up to 24 times more insulin receptors than normal breast cells uh, or even fibrocystic breast cells. Um, now, some were very similar, but on average, there was about six times as many insulin receptors on breast cancer cells. So how does this really work? So when Insulin is released from our pancreas. It binds, like we showed in the prior slide, that it binds the insulin receptor or its sister hormone, insulin-like growth factor, binds insulin-like growth factor receptor, and it turns on certain pathways. Um, and it may turn off other pathways. And so typically insulin is a growth factor. It turns on growing factors. Um, and that's why when we look at medications that medical oncologists uh, give to us, uh, for cancers, they might block some of those growth pathways um, while they um, maybe uh, uh, in, uh, help with the other pathways. So they're trying to stimulate these pathways in different ways by giving various medications. But what we know is that by changing our dietary intake, we can actually change some of these as well. Uh, interestingly, protein restriction um, has been shown to block IGF-1, but really in the setting of a mixed diet, whereas when we're in a ketogenic diet or carbohydrate restriction or even calorie restriction, that can also increase ketones, we're turning on uh, different pathways and we're blocking the growth pathways. Um, and protein is not as big of an issue when we're talking about it in the setting of a ketogenic diet. So to control insulin, we have to really control our blood sugar. And so different foods and different combinations of foods will have different effects on our blood sugar. Many, all of our food doesn't really come in isolated macronutrients like carbohydrate, protein, or fat. Almost every food is a combination thereof. Maybe it's a combination of all three, or many times it's a combination of carbohydrate and protein uh, or protein and fat. And when And you can see by this graph that the more carbohydrate, the bigger the spike in glucose. And when we uh, measure glucose in people with what's called continuous glucose monitors, um, we can see how varying foods can affect different people. So the first um, graph is a, a, a person who's kind of uh, in a pre-diabetic type situation um, where we can see that eating actually a meal that was served at an obesity conference, which was a tuna sandwich on whole wheat bread, a yogurt, an apple, and then a little treat. Um, there is a big spike in blood sugar um, within about an hour, and then it comes down. But interestingly, it comes down even below baseline at about four hours. And sometimes it will be at two or three hours, depending on the degree of insulin dysregulation. But the green line, when the patient was eating a, a carbohydrate restricted diet, so it has some protein and fat and greens, um, that blood sugar remained very steady over many, many hours. In the graph on the right, this was an actual type one diabetic. So this patient does not make insulin and has to give herself insulin. And she was eating a relatively low carbohydrate diet at 80 grams of carbohydrate per day. But you can see those red lines really getting pretty decent spikes every time she ate. Whereas when she went on a very low carbohydrate or carbohydrate restricted diet, she had very steady blood glucoses throughout the day. And this is a study that was done looking at postprandial, so after eating blood glucose levels, but the same meal 
in multiple different patients and multiple times. So each patient ate it twice. Um, and there were probably, I think there's six different patients in this. And you can see how some patients have a very large spike uh, of glucose where, it, so the gray ones had a pretty high spike up to almost 200 um, and still not coming back down. But whereas the yellows had a very mild increase and it was back down within about an hour or so. So again, people have different responses and different foods have different responses. And so what happens with time is, unfortunately, we continue to live in what's called, a, or what I consider a glucose-centric world. So our primary care doctors um, are always keeping an eye on your glucose. And if the glucose is getting a little elevated, they might get a hemoglobin A1C, which is a, uh, a three-month uh, average of glucose. But what I want us to turn into is an insulin centric world with time. So over convenient, you know, multiple years, we'll see that if we look at insulin, insulin is actually rising much earlier and even much higher than glucose does. But at some point, our glucose starts to become unbalanced, meaning it starts to go up. And that's about the same time that probably our pancreas cells are getting tired of pushing out more and more and more insulin. And so they um, start to drop off how much insulin they can produce. And all of a sudden, the sugars start to go crazy. And when we look at the average population, the average American has a uh, an fasting insulin of about nine. And I will tell you that most hospital reference ranges will say anywhere between two and 25 is considered normal. But that's not optimal, that's just average. And as we know, most patients in our environment, we just saw how much obesity and uh, diabetes and everything else is out there, is most people are not healthy. Um, I consider healthy to be less than six, um, and optimally, probably around four or even less than 3.8 is the one I use based on one of the studies we'll go over. But we really want our insulin to be at the very low end of normal. And that is a special, it's not a special test. It's a blood test just like glucose, but it has to be ordered. And a lot of primary cares won't order it because there is no medicine to treat an elevated insulin. The only thing we can do with elevated insulin is to tell you to eat or live differently to bring that down. This is a study by a Dr. Kraft who looked at, instead of looking at glucose response curves, he looked at insulin response curves. So he gave patients a big bolus of glucose, like if you've, anybody's ever done one of those sugar drinking tests and then they measure your uh, glucose, um, that's what we do when we're pregnant, they check that for gestational diabetes. Um, but what he found is that Actually, the majority of people, about 80% of people, had abnormal insulin responses, even though they did not have a diagnosis of diabetes uh, or prediabetes. So only the curve number one is a healthy insulin curve. So uh, how do these things impact our risk of getting cancer? Well, what we know is when we looked at patients, uh, with cancers and looked at their fasting glucose levels, we know that the higher the glucose level, the likelier they are to get a cancer. This has been shown here in uh, colorectal, liver, and pancreatic cancers, although this was done in men. Um, in women, postmenopausal uh, women, so this was looking at 150 patients who had breast cancer, and they found that the patients uh, who had later stage disease, so stage two, three, or four instead of stage one, that they were more likely to be obese, have that obesity in the middle section, that apple fat, the central obesity, and were more likely to have high glucose and or high insulin. And 50% of these later stage patients actually had the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, which is a uh, there's five criteria and you have to meet at least three of them, but they all go hand in hand, higher glucose, higher triglycerides, central obesity, um, hypertension. So compared to only 12% of patients with early stage disease had metabolic syndrome. And patients with node positive disease were much more likely to have uh, high insulin than those patients with node negative disease. Um, pre-treatment 
uh, insulin levels um, have been prognostic, meaning um, depending on your rate of uh, or your level of insulin at time of diagnosis predicts for outcome. Um, so this was a group from, uh, from Italy, I think, that uh, looked at, they did look at glucose, they looked at uh, hemoglobin A1C, they looked at insulin, and they looked at HOMA IR, which is actually a calculation between glucose and insulin. And that HOMA IR um, dictates or, or uh, predicts insulin resistance. And um, you can see that what was statistically significant were those with uh, blood glucose elevation, uh, insulin, and HOMA IR. But when you look at these, we just kind of talked roughly about numbers, but here the average um, insulin in a breast cancer patient was an average of 10, whereas in a control group, it was more like 6.8. So again, even though those are considered well within our normal ranges, the lower your insulin, the lower your risk for cancer. So this is looking at it slightly differently, but looking at different stage. Um, so of those women who had breast cancer, the higher their insulin, their higher the stage. So again, lower insulin, lower stage. And this was looking at um, survival uh, in the same kind of groups. So in all breast cancer patients, those patients who had fasting insulins over 13 did much more poorly than those who had fasting insulin. If we look just at estrogen and progesterone receptor positive breast cancer, same goes if we look for HER2 negative breast cancers. Um, and the same goes actually for premenopausal and postmenopausal patients. Um, Goodwin uh, it was a study that was done in Canada, and they took a group of patients who had earlier stage breast cancers and then followed them for 10 years. And what they looked at was their initial presenting fasting insulin levels. So somehow, I guess Canada draws fasting insulin on all their patients, but they looked at the insulin level at time of diagnosis and then said, how did these people do? And what they found was that high levels of fasting insulin did significantly associate with higher T stage, um, having node positive disease versus node negative and having higher tumor grade. And insulin was strongly associated with BMI and obese women did have a higher rate of metastases. Um, when we look at recurrence based on hazards ratio, so this is just how, how much more, so this doesn't tell us how likely, but how much more likely than the other group. So in the lowest insulin group, um, we use that as a, a one. So that would be our baseline. So you can see that recurrence rate is one or overall survival is one, but it's not a percentage. But then how much more likely is a recurrence uh, or how much uh, worse is overall survival as we climb up that insulin? And you can see that as we move up, in higher insulins, we have more risk of recurrence and we have worse overall survival, as much as eight times worse survival. But remember, as we go up in insulin, we also go up in stage and grade typically. So can we do anything about this? Well, in the wheel study, um, they actually looked at postmenopausal women and looked at insulin-like growth factor one receptors, so the sister receptor to insulin, and carbohydrate intake. So they looked at women both with elevated IGF-1 tumors as well as low IGF-1 tumors, and then they compared uh, the outcomes and looked also at who continued to eat the same or increase their carbohydrate intake versus those who decreased their carbohydrate intake, and even by as little as 25 grams per day. And what you can see is if we just look at IGF-1 receptors, those patients who had higher uh, IGF-1 receptors on their cancer cells, they had a higher risk of recurrence compared to negative or low levels of IGF-1. If taking, again, all comers, so whether you had high IGF-1 or low IGF-1, if you uh, lowered your carbohydrate, they used that as the reference point, and they showed that if you had stable or increased carbohydrate intake from diagnosis, you actually doubled your risk of recurrence. But more compelling 
is really um, the difference in those IGF positive patients. So the IGF one positive cells had dramatically more uh, increased risk of recurrence in those patients who increased their carbohydrate intake, whereas those who decreased their carbohydrate intake um, had reduction in risk. If we look at a stage three colon cancer, each of these colored lines represent a different group of uh, carbohydrate intake. They actually looked at it from what they called an insulinogenic diet. So obviously simple carbohydrates would be more insulin stimulating and those that were higher in fiber or maybe fat and protein would have lower insulinogenic. So they graded each diet for um, the insulin producing potential and then graphed how the patients did. And you can see that the higher the carbohydrate intake or the higher the insulinogenic diet, the worse the outcome. So that would be this orange group down here. When we look at head and neck cancers and carbohydrate intake, again, they just compared diets of head and neck cancer patients. And then they looked at a number of different things. They looked at total carbohydrate intake. They looked at total sugar intake. And they also looked at what's called glycemic load, which is a combination of glycemic index, um, which has to do with how much glucose uh, is equivalent, uh, and load is how much of that food you take in. But the bottom line is the higher the carb, the higher the sugar, the higher the glycemic load, uh, the higher the risk of death in those group of patients. Um, now we're going to get into some smaller studies um, that we're trying to eke out more information, but this is a group of non-small cell lung cancer patients mostly stage three patients who were getting concurrent, meaning together chemo and radiation. And these were um, uh, glucose levels um, in these patients. These were not necessarily fasting. These were just glucose levels that were uh, taken in the lab probably around the time they were getting chemotherapy. But what they found is that patients who had lower uh, glucose levels at any time during or at all times during the treatment, they did much better than the patients who had higher glucose levels. Uh, when they looked at a group of pancreatic cancer patients, again, same thing, the higher the glucose ever was during the course of treatment, uh, the worse the overall outcome. So what can uh, what else do we know after uh, adjusting for age, race, sex, smoking status, physical activity, and body mass index? So we're trying to control those things that we already know may have a problem. Um, every increase uh, in plasma glucose, there is a significant overall cancer mortality increase as well. And insulin resistance was associated with a 41% increased risk of overall cancer mortality. And they were even stronger after excluding lung cancer deaths. So there is something about insulin resistance. And my thing is, let's not wait until we can diagnose insulin resistance. Let's look for hyperinsulinemia. So can we modify metabolism? Can we modify the sugar and insulin response with diet? Um, I want to spend a little time talking about what a ketogenic diet is. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there. But basically, a ketogenic diet is a diet that is very low in carbohydrate intake to help moderate this sugar and insulin response. But it doesn't mean it has to be restrictive, per se. The majority of patients who try it tell me it was much easier than they thought it would be. But it's, it's really about getting yourself into a ketogenic state, meaning that you are burning fat for fuel. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily burning it 100% of the time, but maybe when you're not eating, a few hours after you eat, when you're sleeping at night, um, or when you're doing you know, high energy exercise or something, that you are burning ketones. Um, the oldest ketogenic diet in the book is fasting. They used to fast patients. The average diabetic, um, epileptic, they were fasted to control their sugar. And to be honest, I think fasting is very important. And we've heard maybe a lot recently about intermittent fasting, which we can talk a little bit about. But again, fasting was the earliest treatment for many diseases. 
It lowers uh, the glycogen stores and helps to mobilize fat from fat cells. This is why our body was designed to put on fat so that in periods of fasting, when we didn't have access to food, we could live then off of our stored fat. It's a protective mechanism. Um, it also allows us to recycle damaged cells, um, recycle proteins. Um, certainly we cannot fast indefinitely. We need to then refeed at some point. Um, and what they found back in the day before medications existed is that when they refed, patients recurred um, with their diseases and then would go back and do uh, other modified fasting. So the ketogenic diet, so this was interesting. They're like, okay, we can't fast forever. What can we do? Well, originally they just thought that fasting, um, that these ketones in the bloodstream were maybe byproducts, but not actually helpful. Um, but the fact that ketones were produced is why they came up with the name ketogenic diet. Um, so now we have ketogenic diets or fasting mimicking diets, meaning that if we just replace carbohydrates with fats as our main source of fuel, well, then the body can produce ketones, keeping us in that fat burning mode, not creating that glucose insulin response. And so you get almost the same benefit of fasting, but while maintaining your caloric intake. So you can do that, you know, without any problems. Um, there are various forms of ketogenic diets um, based either on the level of carbohydrate restriction or the fat intake. Um, typically, it might be fat percent. Now, remember, fat's a very dense calorie, so not by volume. It's just a little bit of fat, but it goes a long way. It might be 70 to 80 percent of the calories from fat or fatty animals and proteins um, or fatty plants like avocados, and nuts and seeds. Um, we can create ketones by being in a carbohydrate restricted state, being in a calorie restricted state by intermittent fasting. So giving longer periods of time in between meals. There are also exogenous ketone supplements, which I don't typically recommend except in very specific situations. Um, but there are such things called ketone salts, ketone esters, and even MCT oil or medium chain triglyceride oil. Um, and those um, can produce almost immediate ketones. So for people who maybe have ketone dependent um, needs like seizure disorder, um, even other brain health disorders like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's can benefit maybe from some of that. Um, personally, I just like to make my own ketones by controlling what I eat. Um, I'll show you a couple of trials looking at various diets. So this was a diet or two diets that were tried in a group of patients that did have a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. So some degree of high triglycerides or central obesity or elevated glucose, uh, et cetera. And half of them were put on a low fat diet and half of them were put on a low carbohydrate diet. And what we know is that uh, glucose and insulin both drop in both diets but glucose and insulin drop substantially more in a carbohydrate restricted setting. What I say is that all diets for the most part cut out the worst foods, which are the combination of carbohydrate and fat. So the baked goods, the desserts, the things that are sweet and fat or starchy and fat, um, those are the most problematic foods because those don't come naturally in nature. So what we want are the protein fats or we want the um, fibrous carbohydrates, um, those are the ones that are going to have the best impact on our glucose and insulin. Um, in a group of cancer patients, ovarian and endometrial cancer patients, so this is looking at the American Cancer Society diet, which again is a very good diet. It's Mediterranean diet. It has low bad foods, right? None of those sugar fat combinations, um, looking to get more real whole foods and compared it to a ketogenic diet or a very low carbohydrate diet. And what you see is that, um, again, insulin, insulin-like growth factor and glucose reduce in both groups of patients, but substantially more in a ketogenic or ca carbohydrate restricted diet. And you can see how much visceral fat mass goes down in that as well. And in addition, another uh, finding in that study was that those patients actually had uh, much better control of cravings when they were in a ketogenic state. This is a study in mice that were injected with a very resistant uh, malignant glioma, so uh, one of those brain tumors, the GBM tumors. 
And in the first study, they compared two different diets. So a standard diet versus a ketogenic diet. Um, not the best uh, quality of fats that were used in these trials. Um, most of them were soybean oil based, which I am not a fan of. But you can see that those rats that were on a ketogenic diet still did better than those on a standard diet. But they did not do well, um, as most glioblastomas um, unfortunately don't do so well. But when they combined a ketogenic diet with radiation and compared that to a standard diet with radiation, you can see how much better those mice did. Um, or those rodents did. I can't, I think they were mice, mice or rats. But um, the little blue arrow on graph B is actually the point where the researchers said, wow, all of our other mice are dying. Let's go ahead and put those mice from a ketogenic diet back onto their standard diet and let's see what happens. And in fact, none of them actually recurred. This is a study done in 10 patients that all had metastatic cancer and were, not, or were no longer getting standard uh, aggressive therapies. And they just put them on a ketogenic diet. And what they, and I shouldn't say that, they put them on a, a carbohydrate restricted diet. Some of them did create ketones, thus were in a ketogenic state. And others actually did not necessarily create ketones. And so maybe we're not eating low enough carbohydrate for their personal tolerance. But what we can see is the blue dots are patients who actually had responsive, actually had stable or improved disease doing nothing other than diet, whereas the red dots were doing worse. And what we can see is that if we just look at the bottom two, it didn't matter how much weight they lost or what kind of calorie deficit they were in, that didn't make a difference. But what did make a difference was how much beta hydroxybutyrate or how much ketones they were making. Those who are making more ketones did better. And when they compared it in the B panel uh, in the upper right corner, I put a red mark down the middle where there was no change. But when we looked at beta hydroxybutyrate versus the percent of insulin change, you can see those that lowered their insulin and raise their beta hydroxybutyrate did much better than those who did not. So it's all about lowering insulin and burning fat for fuel. Um, there were a group of patients who had metastatic or advanced uh, breast cancer who got chemotherapy uh, for three months. These patients also either got a ketogenic diet or um, a standard diet. They did look at lab markers. They found that there was a decrease in fasting blood glucose in the ketogenic diet. There was a trend toward an increase in the ketones, um, also a trend in body fat uh, improvement. But you can see here, how did people do? Survival, those in the ketogenic uh, group did better than those who were not. It's very small, so you can't really make a whole lot out of that. Um, another small study in stage four colon cancer, just looking at response to chemotherapy, but this group of patients were put, uh, half of the patients were put on a ketogenic diet with the MCT oils. Um, and what they found is that those patients who were following the ketogenic diet actually had much bigger response rates, meaning when they looked at the cancer how many had partial responses or complete responses. And when we looked at it, it was about 61% versus 20% having any kind of response. But of those having a complete response, meaning that they couldn't really find cancer anymore, it was 50% in the ketogenic group and 0% in the non-ketogenic group. Another interesting uh, a piece of information is there's a new inhibitor uh, medication on the market for breast cancers. It's called a PI3K inhibitor. And what they found is that it seems to work very poorly in the presence of high glucose and high insulin levels, but works very, very well when they're uh, in a ketogenic diet. So this has been studied in cells and in mice, and currently there is a, a, a human trial that is ongoing, but that'll be very interesting because if you can go back to the slide where I showed all the pathways, that PI3K pathway is in the insulin stimulation um, line. So 
what can we do to lower our risk of cancer and low and hopefully improve our outcomes? Well, in my bias, in my in, uh, humble opinion, it is lowering insulin levels and helping to heal and support our mitochondria and improve our metabolic health. So I'll give you a quick briefy on how to do this. Um, first thing, eat real food. Eat it straight from the farm, no processing or little processing, no boxes, bags, or bottles. If you can eat real fats that come in the foods naturally, that's the best kind of fat. And know your fasting insulin, know your fasting glucose. Um, consider wearing a continuous glucose monitor for a month just to educate yourself as to what foods do differently uh, to you. Um, reduce your carb in carbohydrate intake to your own personal tolerance. Everybody's different based on genetics, activity levels, age, um, menopausal status, um, muscle mass. All of those things um, change people's carbohydrate um, tolerance. Um, Add intermittent fasting or some time-restricted feeding. Don't eat six times a day. Allow your pancreas to stop producing insulin at certain points in time. Um, exercise. Hit exercise. Deplete some glycogen. Um, resistance training. Build some lean mass. Um, the, the more lean mass you have, the more insulin sensitive you are. Get good sunlight. Vitamin D is critical to our health. Uh, it's, it's associated with cancer risk. It's associated with COVID risk. It's associated with so many, uh, so low vitamin D is associated with so many of our chronic diseases. Um, improve your circadian rhythm. Go to bed, you know, with the sun, wake up with the sun. Limit your screen times after dark. Um, get quality sleep. Do other mind-body activities such as, uh, you know, gratitude journals, mindfulness, yoga. All of those things can help decrease our stress um, and improve our outcomes. Um, social connections, they found that love, laughter, touch, um, why some of these in-person groups are great. So I can't wait till we get back into in-person meetings. Um, but basically, what do I recommend for most patients? Starting with a very low carbohydrate diet, um, so less than 20 grams, moderate protein, high fat. Again, you don't have to chase fat. It will come along with your food. Um, but I usually, when I started people at higher levels of carbohydrate, I found that not everybody got into ketosis. So if we start very low and then we can moderate up based on patients, um, uh, how they're doing. But if you start with fatty proteins, um, and, and use some healthier fats for cooking or, uh, for adding to vegetables, um, and I put a big knot in the soybean oils, safflower, sunflower, corn, canola, nut and seed oils, those tend to be very high in omega-6. If you eat them from real food, that is fine. But if you eat them already processed down to uh, refined oils, they tend to be very harmful. Um, stick with the low carbohydrate vegetables, leafy greens, non-starchy vegetables. Um, and uh, again, above ground vegetables is my quick and easy way to say it, but that may not necessarily be the case. There are, there are variations. Uh, it's really about learning, um, uh, getting educated, uh, keeping a diary or, or looking up some apps where you can uh, learn that. And then I usually call them the low, <laughs> the low sugar fruits, which maybe you would call vegetables, but there, you can certainly incorporate some level of berries or other low sugar fruits in small uh, amounts, but avocados, olives, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, those are also um, fruits. The, these, this can be done. Um, it's a little more difficult, but it can be done as a vegan or vegetarian, can definitely be done Mediterranean-like. Um, there are even groups out there doing it all carnivore um, and seeing excellent results. So everybody is different in uh, the foods that they prefer, in the foods that make them feel amazing. And I'm looking for optimal health, not just being okay. I don't like when we say, oh, this, this thing hurts, that hurts, this is, I'm just getting old. We don't have to get old. We wanna stay as young as possible until we're done. But we don't wanna slowly you know, get worse and worse and worse. And we can optimize health, absolutely. So just kind of as a comparison, the one cup of cooked oatmeal has the same number of carbohydrates as everything in the rest of the picture. So you can see when you focus on uh, vegetables and low sugar fruits, um, nuts and seeds, that you can get far more food and far more nutrients um, in, um, in the same number of carbohydrate 
so again, optimizing uh, for color um, will get a much better uh, uh, array of micronutrients. Um, it can be done, again, lots of different ways. Hopefully these look somewhat appealing to you, but it's easy to do. Um, and I will close with, again, this is my favorite line, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Um, but we will be resuming. I was doing a, a support group for many years before COVID set us back. Um, but we will be resuming as an online informational meeting slash support group starting next Wednesday. It will be every third Wednesday. Uh, Living Well will be hosting that for us. Um, so please sign up if you have interest and we'll spend usually about half of the meeting. I go over um, just how to's or new studies, um, uh, any you know stuff out in the popular press we try to review. Um, and then I just try to answer questions, help troubleshoot, try to get you to an optimal health. Um, in addition, I also do offer comprehensive metabolic health and micronutrient evaluations. Um, and I do see cancer patients as well as non-cancer patients. So um, I will end there.